Greetings to you in the name of our risen King, Jesus. I want to take a moment to welcome you to this online worship service. I want to say welcome, especially to Samanach Baptist Church. Thank you so much for allowing me to fill in for Pastor David this week. Um, he's such a blessing to me, and so it's a, a privilege to be able to participate in your worship of Christ this week. And also want to welcome uh, my church, Sandwich Church of the Nazarene, to this online uh, worship service and um, want to offer peace to both congregations as we try to be faithful to Christ even today. So I begin by saying, peace be with you. Uh, we'll start our time in worship today by reading from Psalm 95, Psalm 95 verses 1 through 7a. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his. For he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Amen. That psalm invites us to spend a moment together in prayer. I'll invite you to take a posture of prayer, and to hear this prayer of invocation. Let's pray. You raised up your son, O God, and seated him at your right hand as the shepherd and king who seeks what is lost binds up what is wounded, and strengthens what is weak. Empowered by the Spirit, grant that we may share with others that which we have received from your hand. To the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The epistle reading for today comes from Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. This reading invites us to enter into a time of prayer again, into a time of prayer of confession. Christ Jesus, our Lord, has come to lead us into a path of transformation, which we often resist. 
Come, let us return to his way, examining ourselves and silently confessing our sins to our gracious God. God, our Father, long-suffering, full of grace and truth, you create us from nothing and you give us life. You give your faithful people new life in the water of baptism. You do not turn your face from us nor cast us aside. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son, and bring us to resurrection joy in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I want to think for a few minutes, I want us to think about ostriches. But first, we need to read the gospel. Today's gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Herein we hear the word of God to the people of God, and so we say, thanks be to God. Okay, so as I said... I really just want us to think about ostriches, but, you know, uh, yeah, I think, I think we probably should just briefly talk about what day it is. Today is 
Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday in the Christian calendar. It's the culmination of the year of faith. It's the culmination of the story we've been living this last year through the scriptures. And it's the day that we take time to celebrate that Christ is on the throne. And that's what we say today. We say Christ is on the throne. But I'm pretty sure that that doesn't mean that we also say, well, Christ is in control and everything is going exactly as Christ wants it. I mean, look at 2020. How can we imagine that this year has played out the way that Christ desires it? So I want us to think for a moment about what kind of king is Jesus. And here's the picture I want us to see. I want us to see that the king on the throne has a broken heart. I want us to imagine that Jesus, as he sits on the throne at the right hand of God, does not rejoice in the events that has caused suffering and sickness, but that his heart breaks. Okay, I have to say this, just so we're clear. When it comes to kings, neither Joe Biden nor Donald Trump will show up at your door and grieve with you over the loss that this year has left in its wake. Neither of them are going to come and shed tears with you for the distance that you now feel between you and your family, especially as we approach the holidays. But Christ is such a king. That's the thing about our king, Christ. He is a king that is on the throne, but he's also the lamb who is wounded with us. The king feels the pain of those who suffer. That's no small piece of gospel truth. The king on the throne has a broken heart. Reflecting on today's gospel reading, John Wesley wrote these words 234 years ago about our king. This is what he writes. He knows all you suffer. He knows all your pains. He sees all your wants. He sees not only your affliction in general, but every particular circumstance of it. That is the kind of king that we have in Jesus. That is the kind of king that is on the throne of the hub of God's desire that we call heaven. So the picture we see is that the king on the throne not only has a broken heart at the events of this past year, yes, our king does, but as we think about this gospel reading, we also see that the king on the throne has an empty stomach that's twisting around itself in hunger. The king on the throne has an achingly dry throat that cracks and bleeds with thirst. The king on the throne is a stranger, wondering where his home will be. The king on the throne has no clothes for winter that can keep warm his shivering body. The king on the throne has every disease imaginable from cancer to coronavirus. The king on the throne has a life sentence with no parole. Poet Malcolm Geit indicts us with a sonnet that he has written. Our king is calling from the hungry furrows, whilst we are cruising through the aisles of plenty. Our hoardings screen us from the man of sorrows. Our soundtracks drown his murmur, I am thirsty. He stands in line to sign in as a stranger and see a welcome from the world he made. 
we see him only as a threat, a danger. He asks for clothes, we strip search him instead. And if he should fall sick, then we take care that he does not infect our private health. We lock him in the prisons of our fear, lest he unlock the prison of our wealth. But still on Sunday, we shall stand and sing the praises of our hidden Lord and King. That poem is an echo of what we hear in the gospel as Jesus stands as the kingly judge of the world. We heard this in verse 45, then he will answer them. Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. That's a haunting verse. So as we think about what kind of king we have on the throne, we have a king that, yes, grieves with us as we suffer, but we also have a king who is present in the suffering of others. The question is, how will we honor the king? How will we worship the king? Today, on this day, Christ, the King Sunday, but every day as well. It's helpful for us to remember that in the ancient world, when the Gospels were being written, Rome had a particular practice called emperor worship. It was the imperial cult. And if you were living in Rome, if you were a citizen of Rome, or if you were living in their province, you are responsible to go and pay homage in worship and recognize that the Caesar, that the king, was divine. And so you would make sacrifice and you would uh, fall down before this king. That was how that king wanted to be worshipped. That's how Caesar wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to receive into himself the praise and the, the glory of others. I think it's helpful for us to have that in mind when we hear in Matthew's gospel that Jesus is identified as the king of all nations. Because the picture of what honors this king, King Jesus, is very different from this imperial cult, from emperor worship. It's very different than the ways that kings normally want to be honored. Our king, King Jesus, is honored not when we uh, come and offer more up to him and give him glory where he doesn't want his head to to swell. He's not looking to have us um, polish his ego and, and make it shine. Our king is honored in our treatment of the poor, the sick, the stranger, the lonely, the imprisoned. That's how King Jesus wants to be honored. That's how King Jesus wants to be worshiped. That's how King Jesus knows who his citizens truly are. We heard also in verse 40, and the king will answer them. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Our king is, as Malcolm Geit says, hidden in the least among us. So I kind of wonder then, how can we say Christ is king? I imagine that if we were hearing that from the outside of the context of what we've been um, looking at this morning or this evening, I imagine that um, it might sound kind of crazy to proclaim Christ as king. I mean, when we look at the state of things around us, it can kind of, to me, I, I was thinking earlier this week, it kind of seems like folly to proclaim that Christ is king. I mean, we read in Ephesians 1, doesn't this, in light of all that's happening, sound somewhat ridiculous that God put, his, the, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come? And he has put all things under his feet. I mean, how do we how do we say that right now with all that's going on? That Christ is seated on the throne, that Christ is the King of Kings. It, 
it, to me, I, I can't help but wonder, is this some way of us merely sticking our heads in the sand? And there, at last, that brings us to our time to talk about ostriches. Okay, so uh, I, I was reading about ostriches online, as one does, you know. I found an article uh, from, this, uh, from a zoo, and it was talking about some misconceptions about ostriches. Now, I believed this misconception that ostriches stick their head in the sand. I, I feel like I've seen that in cartoons or something. I don't know. I, that's what I thought. But I learned that that is not the case. An ostrich does not bury its head in the sand when it senses danger. And so I want to say, we also can't just bury our head in the sand. We can't pretend that bad things aren't happening, and we can't pretend that suffering doesn't matter by saying something like, oh, well, Christ is still on the throne. He's in control. I think sometimes we can say Christ is king as a way to simply bury our head in the sand, but I don't think that's how the scriptures invite us to think about Christ as king. So I think like ostriches, we best not bury our head in the sand. But an ostrich, when it senses danger, when it senses something is wrong, its first instinct is that it will try to run away. Now, ostriches are very fast, and so they're good at running. I also feel, perhaps, that um, we have this instinctual tendency to avoid. I, I think about all the weird uh, emotional things that... Um, quarantine and sickness and racial tension has brought up in even in myself this year and I think about all the times that my instinct is just to run away to avoid it but here's the thing even our fast-footed flightless feathered friends know that there are some things they cannot outrun and I think that we need to remember there are some things we cannot simply avoid so we don't use Christ as king as a way to bury a head in our sands. We don't use Christ as king as a way to avoid all that's happening. So uh, the, the ostrich does not bury its head in the sand. The ostrich, if it knows it can't run away, it has another option. When it senses something wrong, what does it do? This is great. It falls to the ground and remains still. I feel like I totally can identify with ostriches when I hear that. I don't know about you, but especially in 2020. It just falls to the ground and remains still. And actually, this is where the misconception comes, because the ostrich's neck and head is a sandy color. So when it lays down on the desert floor, its neck and head blend in with the sand from a distance, and it appears that the head has been stuck into the sand. But it's not. It's just laying there, doing absolutely nothing. And part of me thinks that is gospel truth, that we would do well to learn the lesson of the ostrich, to fall prostrate before the king of kings and keep still. Part of me wants to preach that. But here's the problem. That is not at all what the gospel reading for today calls us to do. Jesus in this passage is not at all interested in us falling down and worshiping him and being still. This gospel, this judgment scene calls us to get to work, to do the works of faith. Except <laughs> that's hard right now for a myriad of reasons, not least of which is that it's quite difficult to care for one another and for others when being together is not always a safe option. So can I confess to you this, this during this worship online gathering? I would rather be an ostrich. I would rather fall down, be still, and call it worship. But that's not the gospel. I'm helped when I remember 
those to whom the Gospel of Matthew was first written, the first readers of the Gospel of Matthew. They would have been Jews who followed Christ and proclaimed him as the fulfillment of all of Israel and as their way of living faithful to God. But here's the thing. They were living in the days after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, you might be asking, why does that matter, you weird nerd? That's a fair question. But let me tell you, it matters to remember this because it means that the first Christians who read this text, the first Christians who gathered around it in community and struggled with it, who wrestled with these words of judgment as a congregation were also Christians who felt that their world was crumbling around them. And yet, the gospel says, get to it. I was uh, given a recently published article this weekend about an organization called Kitchens for Good in San Diego, California. This organization, organization was founded in 2014 to provide 20 months of free culinary job training for people transitioning out of incarceration, homelessness, and foster care. The apprentices start with a 12-week prep course where they learn both knife skills and life skills. And they progress to 17 months of paid on-the-job training with the organization's restaurant and hotel partners. They also transform surplus and cosmetically imperfect food from wholesalers and farmers into 2,000 meals per week for the hungry. And here's the kicker. The co-founder says that for this fiscal year, their goal is to train 148 apprentices and prepare 275,000 meals for the hungry as the COVID-19 pandemic continues. In the midst of a world that feels like it's crumbling, the gospel says, get to work. Honor the king. And I want to just pause for a moment and observe that I believe that you, the church in our communities, are doing just that. You're caring for the sick, for the hungry. You're delivering meals on wheels. You're supporting and assisting food pantries. You're participating in coat drives. You're communicating with the lonely and welcoming the stranger in whatever weird way we have to with technology. I believe that you know exactly what it means to honor the king even now. And so I want to leave you as we come to the end of, of this sermon with a few more words from John Wesley in that same sermon that I quoted from earlier. This is what he says, and I want, I want you to hear this today. Go on, go on, thou poor disciple of a poor master. Do as he did in the days of his flesh. Whenever thou hast an opportunity, go about doing good and healing all that are oppressed of the devil, encouraging them, shake off his chains, chains and fly immediately to Christ. My prayer is that we would honor the king, our king, in the way that the king has instructed, that we wouldn't bury our heads in the sand, that we wouldn't avoid, that we wouldn't fall down and keep still in worship as an excuse to not take care of our king. May we be those who even in these days are tending to the most vulnerable among us, our King, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. It's our privilege to come before our King with our petitions, to enter into a time of intercessory prayer. When I pray, your kingdom come, you can respond, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Rejoice in the Lord always. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Abba God, we bring our prayers to you as acts of love for you and for our neighbors. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Your presence and your reign are already with us. We pray for ourselves and for those dear to us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your faithfulness lasts forever. We pray for our community and for our neighbors. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your people serve you with gladness. We pray for the church in all places that we may know the freedom of life in the spirit. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your way is justice and peace. We pray for the world and for all who care for creation. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We offer you other concerns we carry in our hearts.
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God of grace and glory, you fling the stars into the heavens. You see every sparrow fall. Deepen our trust in the mystery of your power shining through King Jesus, that we may live your love for the world. In the name of the one who taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I'd invite you, if you would like, you can place your hands out in front of you in a posture of reception as I offer this benediction. God, we come to you in the name of our King, Jesus. We are so thankful to have a king who comes to us in places that we might consider unlikely or unworthy or undesirable. But with the spirit of God who was present with our king at his resurrection, who rejoiced as he took the throne in heaven, and who rests within us now until his return. May that spirit send us to minister to our king in all the hidden places that he wants to be found. We pray this in his name. Amen. Go in the peace of our king.